In this short tutorial, we will be discussing evaluation of complications of early pregnancy on ultrasound. This is the normal timeline of an early pregnancy. The first structure that you're going to see in the endometrium is the gestational sac. You see it about five weeks. Uh, after that, you'll see the yolk sac. And then about at six weeks, you should be able to see a fetal, port, fetal pole with heart rate. Normal early pregnancies, there are a couple of signs that have been described. Intradistitial sign where you see an eccentrically located gestational sac uh, in the echogenic decidua. The second sign is double, double sac sign consisting of these two concentric echogenic rim with a tiny fluid collection. Uh, of endometrial fluid. The inner ring is the Deciria capsularis around the chorion and the outer ring is the Deciria parietalis. In clinical practice, these signs are not usually that useful. The common normal pregnancy that you're going to see uh, is going to be a small fetal pole, a yolk sac and a normal sized gestational sac. That's going to be the normal pregnancy for you in most cases. This NEGM article uh, is very important uh, when, you this, when you have to decide if this is early pregnancy failure. The criteria that are diagnostic of early pregnancy failure are a crown rump length of more than seven millimeters without heartbeat and mean sac diameter more than equal to 25 without an embryo. So an empty, large empty gestational sac. If you see anything else, uh, you suggest a follow up after two weeks, because that will cover both these criteria. Along with these findings diagnostic for pregnancy failure, there are a few findings suspicious for early pregnancy failure. Uh, if you see any of these findings, it would be a good idea to have a conversation with the patient regarding this, just so that they have realistic expectations for their follow-up scan. So if you look at this case, this was a 12 millimeter CRL fetal pole without any heartbeat on the M mode Doppler. So this is a finding diagnostic of early pregnancy failure. The second case shows a large gestational sac. Average was, I think, around uh, 26 to 27 millimeters, so above the cutoff rate, and there was no embryo. So this was also an early pregnancy failure. This one here, uh, a follow-up scan after 11 days did not show significant growth and there's no heart rate on the follow-up study. So this was also early pregnancy failure. Now, what are findings that are suggestive of poor prognosis? So an irregular gestational sac. Uh, sometimes you may also see linear echogenic foci in the sac, which would suggest intrasac hemorrhage. So that's suggestive of poor prognosis. A large yolk sac. So if you look at this yolk sac uh, compared to the gestational sac, it's fairly large. So anything more than so the commonly the yolk sac uh, in early pregnancy is going to be anywhere uh, less than five millimeter. If you see a sac which is more than seven to eight millimeters, that is one of the signs of uh, poor prognosis. Another sign is a small gestational sac. Uh, look at this case, the fetal looks uh, cramped in this space. So that's a sign. Another sign is a large amnion with a calcified uh, yolk sac. So fairly large amnion. You don't see a nice fetal pole. The other findings are bradycardia. So sustained fetal heart rate below 90 beats per minute suggests bradycardia and that's a poor prognostic sign. In early pregnancy, the fetal heart rate is usually at the higher side, 150, 160. That's a good normal heart rate. Finally, subchorionic hemorrhage, which is large, that covers more than two thirds of the gestational sac would also suggest a poor prognosis. So subchorionic hemorrhage is a common incidental finding on early uh, pregnancy scans. In most cases, it's gonna be small. When it's more than two thirds, we call it large, and that is suggestive of that is a factor uh, that is a sign of poor prognosis. Other signs uh, include, say, if you have a large perigestational hemorrhage in a patient who is more than 35 years of age and the gestational age is less than eight weeks, that also, these are also factors that would suggest poor prognosis. There are a few terms that have been used for early pregnancy failure. So there are different subtypes. I would prefer you use the term early pregnancy failure for all uh, these 
uh, subtypes and describe the findings because these can cause confusion. I'll we can have a look at these just so that you understand because the gynees are more well versed with these terms. So threatened abortion would be when there is bleeding, but there's no cervical dilatation. On ultrasound, you may see an empty uterus uh, or an intrauterine gestational sac with or without an embryo, and there may be perigestational hemorrhage. Now, similar findings when you see with an open internal loss, sometimes you may see either hemorrhage or the sac in the lower endometrium or endocervix that would suggest inevitable miscarriage. Uh, so basically, this is going to progress to a miscarriage. So that is inevitable miscarriage. Incomplete abortion is when the cervical dilatation with partial expulsion of products and you will see detained products of conception, some endometrial. Missed abortion is when there is fetal demise and there is no expulsion of products. So on ultrasound, you would see a gestational sac with the fetus, but no cardiac activity or a large gestational sac as we saw earlier. Complete abortion is when there is complete expulsion of products, the uterus is empty and there are no retained products of conception. Now, uh, anything in between a normal pregnancy and uh, definite failure would be pregnancy of uncertain viability. Uh, in these cases, it's best to suggest a follow-up in two weeks. For example, in this patient, the CRL is slightly less than seven millimeter uh, and you don't see a fetal heart rate. You suggest, you would suggest a follow-up in two weeks and see if uh, there is any heart rate. Next complication that you may see in pregnancy would be retained products of conception. So uh, on ultrasound, what you would see, the, the findings are, if you see a thickened heterogeneous endometrium, uh, usually more than 10 millimeters, you may see an endometrial mass, which is separate from the normal endometrium. So if you look at this case, uh, so that's the normal endometrium towards the periphery. And there is this ill-defined echogenic mass. And on Doppler, there is vascularity. So presence of flow in a thickened endometrium or an endometrial mass in a postpartum patient, in a patient who had early pregnancy failure, presenting with bleeding uh, would suggest retained products of conception. If it's highly vascular, make a note of it. In most cases, it is going to be vascular. And when you see anything like this, make sure uh, that we have acquired spectral Doppler uh, to understand the waveform and how vascular this uh, these blood products are. Because if they are highly vascular, you can let the uh, the clinicians know and that will, these patients would bleed a lot during DNC. Important differentials that you should consider are AVM. So in AVMs, uh, the vascularity would is centered on the myometrium, whereas in RPOC, the vascularity is centered on the endometrium. The other differential is that AVMs are usually very vascular. So the blood flow and the peak systolic velocities that you're going to see are going to be above say 200, 300, uh, so in that range, and they'll have a lot of diastolic flow. So that would distinguish an AVM versus an RPOC. Other non-obstructive conditions such as polyps, uh, submucosal fibroids, those can mimic uh, RPOCs, but polyps will usually have a single vascular stock and fibroids would not be uh, vascular in most cases, uh, like as in the Doppler vascularity would not be that evident. Finally, gestational trophoblastic disease is another, is another differential, but usually these would be larger. They may show some cystic changes and clinically uh, this patient will have a persistent elevated beta HCG, whereas in RPOC, the beta HCGs would drop. This was a nice case that we had diagnosed uh, recently. So this patient had large blood vessels surrounding the endometrium. The endometrium was thickened. There were cystic spaces. These cystic spaces on grayscale were actually vessels on Doppler. Uh, and if you look at the spectral flow here, look at the velocity. So they are quite high. There's very high diastolic flow. So we suggested that this is an AVM. Unfortunately, for some reason, they decided to go ahead to do a DNC. Uh, this patient bled significantly on the table, had to be taken to the ER, Taken to the taken to IR and they had to embolize their uh, uh, vessels. So remember that whenever you see or suspect an RPOC, carefully look at the spectral Doppler uh, to rule out an AVM. Although it is very rare, uh, this is a challenging differential.
Finally, uh, there may be times when the patient is pregnant and you don't see any uh, intrauterine gestational sac. The endometrium looks pretty normal like this case. So the differentials for this would be a failed pregnancy uh, and uh, an ectopic pregnancy and a very early intrauterine pregnancy. So whenever you see anything like this, again, a follow-up in about 14 days is best because by that time, if this patient uh, truly has a pregnancy, you will see the gestational sac. The other thing that you would want to rule out uh, in these patients is ectopic. So carefully look for an adnexal mass and only if you don't see an adnexal mass suggest a follow-up. Uh, ectopic pregnancies, we discussed this in detail on our pelvic emergency SOC. So uh, watch that if you haven't watched already. Uh, quickly, We'll quickly revise it. So what the findings of an ectopic pregnancy would be if you don't see an intrauterine gestational sac and an adnexal mass separate from the ovary that would suggest an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, let's look at this case. So the left ovary is displaced anteriorly. There is a separate left adnexal mass. i let it loop for a while. So this is a left adnexal mass and there is moderate volume hemoperitoneum, which is evident by these low level internal echoes here. So this was a case of an ectopic, ruptured ectopic pregnancy. The next pathology that you should be aware of is gestational trophoblastic disease. So this is a spectrum uh, which has benign and malignant conditions. The benign ones would be complete and partial moles. So uh, the clinical findings would be very high beta HCG levels uh, and the patient will have hyperemesis gravidarum, so excessive vomiting because beta HCG is known to cause this. Again, uh, it is not a very specific sign, but if a patient has been pregnant before, you can ask her if her symptoms are worse than what they were at her prior pregnancy. Complete mole, usually the uterus would be large for date. And you'll see there are a couple of findings that have been described. Uh, the first is a snowstorm appearance where the endometrium would be filled with echogenic uh, material with multiple small hypoechoic foci. The second is a cluster of grapes where, uh, again, the endometrium would be filled with heterogeneous material and there will be multiple cystic foci in the endometrium. In a patient who's pregnant, if you see either of these appearances, uh, then there's, uh, especially when the endometrium is expanded, this you should consider a molar pregnancy as a differential. This would be a complete mole, so you don't see any fetal part. Partial moles are difficult to diagnose in ultrasound. You may see an enlarged placenta relative to the uterus uh, with cystic changes, which is known as a Swiss cheese appearance. Again, very, very challenging. So if you see a gestational sac and adjacent cystic changes in the endometrium, you can think of this diagnosis. And again, most pregnancies are normal. Uh, that's what you're going to see. But with pregnancies, uh, always be ready for surprises. Uh, for example, in this case, this patient had an IUCD in place and there is a intrauterine gestational sac. Key points, confirm. So that your job as a radiologist is to confirm the location. Uh, so intrauterine versus an ectopic. Determine viability, look for those key signs, CRL more than seven millimeters, and gestational sac more than 25 millimeters. And finally, date the pregnancy. If you see a live intrauterine gestation, uh, if the CRL is more than 10 millimeters, you can confidently date it at that stage. If the CRL is less than 10 millimeters, then we need to date it at a subsequent scan. This can be a first trimester scan, or you can perform a follow-up in two weeks. Uh, as I suggested, if you are, if it's a pregnancy of unknown location or uncertain viability, a follow-up in two weeks is suggested. If you don't see a pregnancy, so if for a pregnancy of unknown location, differentials would be a very early intrauterine pregnancy, a failed pregnancy, or an ectopic pregnancy, suggest a follow-up in two weeks and beta HCG level correlation. Uh, if you don't see an intrauterine pregnancy and the patient is pregnant, uh, look for a nexal mass separate from the ovary that would suggest an ectopic pregnancy. When you see thickened endometrium or an endometrial echogenic mass with vascularity, think of RPOC, make sure you uh, look at the spectral flow and distinguish it from an AVM. Finally, if you see expanded endometrial cavity with cystic changes, 
think of a complete molar pregnancy. These are my references. Thank you. That's my Twitter handle. You can follow me there for more radiology content.